In order to successfully use the Nashville number system, you will need to be able to do the following. Number one, know the alphabet from A to G. Two, count from one to seven. Three, know the pattern for a major scale. And number four, understand what sharp and flat means. Now, if you already know all of that, you are well on your way. And if you don't, we'll explain as we go. But first, I wanna to talk to you about how the Nashville number system is based on a pattern. While almost all aspects of music are based on patterns, many times we can't see them because it's too complicated. Let me give you an example. Below are three lists of major cities in the United States of America. Take a moment to memorize the list. Okay, now what were the names of all nine major U.S. cities? Los Angeles, Phoenix, Dallas, San Francisco, Salt Lake, Denver, Chicago, Cleveland, and Pittsburgh. Now that may have seemed a difficult task because it looks like a list and not a pattern. But when you know the pattern, you don't need to memorize the names of the list, you just need to know where to start. The pattern here is the next major city directly east. Once you know where to begin, if you know United States of America geography, you can easily fill in the rest of the list because the pattern is the same throughout, although every name is different. Let's try it again with something else, and this time, look for the pattern. Take a moment to memorize. Okay, what were all nine words? Chicken, eggs, omelet. Trees, apple, pie, cow, milk, and cheese. How'd you do? Better? While not completely easy, you probably did much better because you recognize the pattern of something that produces food, the food they produce, and something you make with the food. Knowing this pattern helps you figure out the answer instead of memorizing the answer even if you have never seen it before. For example, using the pattern we just saw, what would the names of the list be if you knew the last one was bread? Well, a good guess would be flour and wheat. How did you know that? Because you know the pattern. Now let's take a look at how that applies to music. Below are the chord progressions to three different songs. Take a moment to memorize them, but look for the patterns. Okay, how'd you do? G, C, D, E minor, C, D, E flat, A flat, B flat, C minor, A flat, B flat. And finally, C, F, G, A minor, F, G. Now you may have seen the first pattern, which is that you have three letters, for example, here in the first one, G, C, and D, and then you repeat the last two letters. C and D. Now this pattern holds true for each example. However, what is less obvious is that these patterns are actually exactly the same in another way. If you follow the patterns of the notes that are represented by these letters, they are all exactly the same distance apart from each other. If you start at G, playing C is the same distance as going from E flat to A flat, which is the same as going from C to F. Why that is confusing is because we are using letters to identify the notes instead of numbers. Now in standard notation, we use these letters to describe their exact location. But if we use numbers, they will reveal the pattern. This is the key to the Nashville number system. So in each of these examples, we will replace the first letter of the pattern with the number one. In other musical languages, this would be known as the root, the tonic, do, and more. So for now, it's one, C, D, E minor, C, D. And in the next set, one, A flat, B flat, C minor, A flat, B flat. And then the last one, one, F, G, A minor, F, and then G. We then use the pattern of a major scale to find out how far each note is away from each other. And that becomes their new name. Let me show you. If G is our starting place, then by following the pattern of a major scale, we start counting at one, and then two for the next note, then three, and then we find that C is actually the fourth note of the major scale when we begin at G. 
So instead of writing C, we simply write 4. 1, 4, D, E minor, C, and D. Now this applies for every time that we have used C in this particular chord progression. So we also can change the next C to a 4. 1, 4, D, E minor, 4, and then D. The next note in our pattern of a major scale is also the next one on our list, D, which makes it the fifth. D is the fifth note in the major scale when you begin at G. So we change D to five. This also applies for every time we've used D in this particular progression. So we also replace the last name with five. So now we have one, four, five, E minor, four, and five. Our last note to rename is E minor, but don't get distracted by that little M or by the word minor. We are just looking for where E falls in our pattern. If we start at G and follow the major scale, counting up as we get to each note, we already know that G is one, A is the two, B is the three, C is the four, D is the five, and now we find E is the six. So instead of writing E minor, we can replace it with a six. The pattern is now complete as one, four, five, six, four, five. Now, as we will later discuss in our pattern, six is always going to be a minor chord. So you don't have to write six minor, but sometimes it's nice to just have the reminder. So leave it in if you want to. When we apply this same technique of renaming notes by the pattern of their relative distance from the beginning notes to these other chord progressions, we find that the patterns are indeed exactly the same. That if we begin at E flat, that A flat would be the four, B flat would be the five, C minor is the six, and so on. So now take a look at these chord progressions and try and memorize them. Okay, how'd you do? Well, hopefully much better. It is in the simple but powerfully different approach to naming the notes that we can easily see that many diverse songs such as Don't Stop Believin' by Journey, Let It Be by The Beatles, and Someone Like You by Adele have the exact same chord progression. But it gets even better. Right now, this is still a little complicated because at the moment we are translating one form of written communication to another, something that many of you will have to do. But remember, this system was developed by people who didn't know music, so don't overthink it. The key to this system is knowing the patterns. The first system is that of the alphabet. A is followed by B, then C to D to E to F, and then finally to G. Then in music, the pattern returns again to A. This pattern continues in a loop both up and down. The next is the system of numbers that one is followed by two to three to four to five to six to seven and then much like our musical alphabet system it loops back to one after seven so the note eight notes away from the one sometimes called an octave is also known as the one and the pattern continues on those two are pretty easy to understand as they are just slight variations on systems that we use every day but let's take a moment to understand the major scale Again, keep in mind you don't need to know the names of the notes, just their pattern. Most of the world recognizes that in between notes that have the same name, there are 12 different notes. That between C and the next C, there are 12 notes. And between G and the next G, there are 12 notes. And between B flat and the next B flat, there are 12 notes. The distance between each note is known as a half step, or in some places, a semitone. Now on a guitar this is easily seen as each fret represents a half step. If we play the first fret of the highest string, which is an F, and then move up the fretboard a fret at a time, we will play all 12 half steps until we get to the 13th fret and the pattern repeats as the name of the note on the 13th fret is also F. Playing every possible note in between two notes with the same name is something called a chromatic scale. In the major scale, however, we follow a different pattern to get to the final destination. Instead of playing every note possible, we skip some, something we call a whole step. 
This is the pattern that will help you interpret and translate the Nashville number system. It is whole step, whole step, half step, whole step, whole step, whole step, half step. So with the guitar, we will play the first fret, then skip the second fret and play the third fret, a whole step. Then we will make another whole step and play the fifth fret. Then following the pattern, we will not skip, but play the sixth fret, a half step. The pattern then calls for three whole steps in a row. So we will play the 8th fret, then the 10th fret, and finally the 12th fret. But we have one more half step to go before we get to the F, which is on the 13th fret. So the pattern again is whole step, whole step, half step, whole step, whole step, whole step, half step. Some musical languages would say do, re, mi, fa, so, la, ti, do, or would name the specific names of each note, F, G, A, B flat, and so on. But in the Nashville number system, we refer to them by the distance from the first note, one, two, three, four, five, six, and seven. Now don't get confused by the number of the fret because soon the pattern will become second nature. Now on a piano, this pattern is actually part of the design of the instrument. And unlike a guitar where the half steps are evenly distributed, the piano is laid out in a major scale. Now the half steps not included in the major scale were moved back on the keyboard and given a different color or material to easily distinguish them from the others. Now this is the most obvious when you begin here at what's known as middle C. By starting here at C and following the pattern of a major scale, we can see that when we go to skip the first half step, it's halfway done for us. The half step is moved back and the next note in the scale is right next to the first one. Now this happens when we go to skip the next half step, then according to the major scale pattern of whole step, whole step, half step, we see that there is no key in between these two keys as they are only a half step apart. The next three steps in the pattern are whole steps, which you can see these three black keys. Then in the final step to return to the next C, we find no black key. So if you can picture the piano keyboard, you can easily remember the pattern. Two whole steps, one half, three whole steps, and one half. Now let's put these three patterns we have learned all together. The alphabet to G, counting to seven, and now the major scale. So let's begin at C. But where is that? This is the first critical step. It is important to know where C is, otherwise you don't know where to start using your pattern. Now that you know where to begin, forget about the alphabet completely. In fact, you don't even have to know the alphabet names to begin with if you can hear it by ear. But for the rest of us, we at a minimum need to know the alphabet names so we can get started. Now, instead of referring to the note as C, it is now the one. Then by following the pattern of a major scale and counting up to seven, we find where our other notes are. We start at one, take a whole step. This note is now the two. We take another whole step and this note is now the three. The real name of this note is E, but nobody cares. After a half step, we find the four, then three whole steps in a row reveal five, six, and seven. And after a half step, we arrive back at the one. The instrument this system is most easily applied to is the bass guitar. So let's write a simple chord progression and have it play along. We will begin at C, so it becomes our one. This is where C is most commonly played on a bass guitar. We will then use our major scale pattern to find the other notes available to us. We will make a whole step by skipping over the fourth fret and onto the fifth fret. This note is now the two. We make a whole step to the seventh fret. This note is the three. Half step to the eighth fret. This is four. Whole step three times to find five, six, and seven, and then go up one fret to half step to the one. So these are our seven notes. One, two, three, four, five, six, and seven and we begin to repeat again at the one. Now here is a sample chord chart. One, six, four, five, one, six, five. Let's find those notes. The one, two, three, here is the four, here is the five, 
and here is the six. We will go from one to six, then to four, and then to five, then back to the one, then to six again, and then back again to the five. Now let's do the same pattern on the piano using only single notes for now. We first must know where to begin. In this example, I have communicated that we will start at C. So we find C and then follow our pattern to discover the notes we will be playing. Whole step, whole step, half step, whole step, whole step, whole step, and half step. We now forget that this is called C and we relabel the notes one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and again, one. Let's look at that same chord progression again. One, six, four, five, one, six, five. We know that this is the one and we go up the pattern of the major scale and count to seven. Here is the two, the three, the four, the five, the six, and the seven. So we will go from one to the six, then to the four, and then to the five, back to the one, to the six, and to the five. Easy. You rename the notes by following the pattern of a major scale after you know where to start. Then you follow the pattern of the chord progression with the group of notes. This group of notes that work together are known as a key. People will need to know what key you are in, which in the Nashville number system simply means where do you start your pattern from. Once you know where to start, you don't need to use the actual names of the notes anymore. But if you're keeping track, we've only gone through three of our four patterns you must know in order to effectively use the Nashville number system. Number one was know the alphabet from A to G. Number two was count from one to seven. And number three was know the pattern of a major scale. But what about the fourth one? To understand the system of sharps and flats. So what are they? The simple definition is that sharp instructs you to move a half step higher and flat means you should move a half step lower. But why do we need these? Well, the major scale so influenced the naming of the notes in standard notation that only seven of those 12 possible notes received an actual letter, A, B, C, D, E, F, and finally G. But what about the other five? Because these notes are the notes that are left out of a major scale, it was decided to give them two half names. So the note in between A and B is both A sharp, because it's a half step above A, and B flat because it's a half step down from B. Also, the note in between C and D is both C sharp and D flat. So which one is it? Is it C sharp or D flat? Well, it depends on who you talk to. In the Nashville number system, nobody really cares about the proper use of sharps and flats because these names, again, are just to get you started. Once you know where to begin your pattern, you don't need them anymore. Unless, of course, you're translating them for people into another musical language. But the simple rule is, for those of you that are interested, is that each group of seven major scale notes, known as a key, has only one of each letter. So you wouldn't have A and A flat in the same key. Now that may be the right note, but you would call it G sharp and not A flat. You would also not have both sharps and flats in the same key. For instance, it would not go from F sharp to E flat. It would either go from G flat to E flat or F sharp to D sharp. So we only need to know the names of the notes to get started. Then we follow the pattern. Let's take a look at how that works by starting on notes other than C. Now G is one of the most commonly used keys. What are the names of the seven notes in the key of G? Don't care. What do I need to know? Where it is so I can begin my pattern. On a guitar, the most common place to play G is here on the third fret of the lowest string. Now by following our major scale pattern, I can find the notes available to me. Two whole steps, half step. Three whole steps, half step. Now instead of using a linear scale on only one string, I can use a more common pattern to find the notes on three strings like this. The pattern is third fret to fifth fret, skip to the next string, second fret, third fret, and then fifth fret. Then skip to the next string and play the second fret, the fourth fret, and then the fifth fret. Again, do, re, mi, fa, so, la, ti, and do, 
or in our case, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, one. So let's do that again by starting in a different note, which would be in a different key. How about A flat? First of all, we have to know where A flat is. We know that the alphabet pattern goes A, B, C, D, E, F, G, and then repeats again to A. However, we must know that in between G and A is a whole step. So playing the note immediately next to G is not actually A, but in fact is G sharp or A flat, which is in fact the note that we are looking for. We now know where to begin our major scale pattern. We will use again the two patterns to find these notes, first on one string, and now on three strings. Did you notice something? Watch how we found the notes for the key of G. Now watch how we found the notes for the key of A flat. Did you notice how the pattern is exactly the same? Watch again, as the only difference to playing in different keys on a guitar is where you begin. This is what makes the system so widely used here in Nashville. It's because Nashville is a guitar town and the guitar is extremely patterned in ways that may not be so obvious to many. However, if you learn to play your instrument in patterns, once you know how to play in one key, you know how to play in all keys. By simply moving my hand up the fretboard to play the first note of any key, I play the same pattern. E flat, D flat, do I know the names of the notes I'm playing? Nope, don't have to. I know the pattern. So this works great for playing solos and for single string instruments such as the bass. But what if you play an instrument that can make chords? Well, I'm glad you asked. As mentioned earlier, we use the Nashville number system to identify chord progressions, not just note progressions. But for all of our chord playing friends out there, you will need to know two more things to be successful. Number one, no chord formations or how to make them. Number two, know the major and minor chord pattern. For many of you, especially guitar players, you have memorized a number of chord forms. So when you see G on a chord sheet, you automatically know to move your fingers to these positions. You did this by having someone show you or by looking at a chord chart like this that tells you what the name of the chord is and where to put your fingers. This also can be true on the keyboard, that you just know by memorization that this is an A chord and this is a B flat chord. This is the simplest way to play. However, there is a pattern to be discovered in how these chords we've memorized are actually formed, that if learned puts you on the fast track to a high level of skill. The good news is that all the chords within a key are made by using only the notes that are in the key and you've already learned how to find them. For illustrative purposes, we will demonstrate this in the key of C. Notice that as I go through this example that every chord we form will only be made using the white keys. Again, that's because basic chords are formed by using the seven notes in the major scale, starting on the number of the chord we want to play and follow this pattern. Play the note, skip a note, play the next note, skip a note, play the next note. So on the keyboard, if we are to play in the key of C, if we are playing the one chord, which will begin at C, we then do the major scale to find our notes. Then to make a chord, we will play the one, skip a note, play the three, skip a note, and play the five, like this, one, three, five. If we are going to play the five chord, we begin at the fifth note of the scale, beginning at C. You will play that fifth note skip a note, play the next note, skip a note, play that note, like this, five, seven, two. Then if we want to play the sixth chord, we begin on the sixth note of the scale, play that note, skip a note, play the note, skip a note, and then play the note. Notice how different that sounds. That's because this is a minor chord. Listen to the fifth chord and now the sixth chord. In standard notation, this would be called a major triad, and this would be called a minor triad. If you repeat this pattern for making chords for all seven of the notes in the key, you will find the last basic pattern to memorize. One is major, two is minor, 
3 is minor, 4 is major, 5 is major, 6 is minor, and 7 is diminished. So when I said before that you don't have to write 6 minor, but instead can just use a 6, it is because 6 is always minor, and so is 2, and so is 3. So the pattern 1, 4, and 5 are major, 2, 3, and 6 are minor, 7 is diminished. Now, whoa, that was way too much for Nashville because it's all about the patterns. Just memorize those and you don't have to understand what you're doing. Now, let's add these last two ideas to what we've learned so far. Now, on a guitar, in the key of G, this is one of the many forms of a G chord. This is the two minor, or A minor. This is the three minor, B minor. And this is the four, or what's known as C, this is the 5, which is D, and this is the 6 minor, which is E minor, and finally the 7, which is F sharp diminished. Then, when you see a chord progression, such as 1, 4, 5, 6, 5, you will play 1 major, 4 major, 5 major, 6 minor, and 5 major. But what if I want to play an A? Now, while you can memorize all the chord formations for the key of A, you could also just add a capo onto the second fret and play the exact same chord formations as you did for the key of G. One major, two minor, three minor, four major, five major, six minor, seven diminished, or one, four, five, six, five. And this works for every key. For most acoustic guitar players, if they can memorize the chord patterns of the key of G, the key of D, and the key of E, they will be able to use a capo to modify the key in order to play open chords for almost any song. Not because you know the names of the notes, but because you know where they are in the pattern. So what about instruments besides those based on a guitar? Well, it really comes down to knowing your scales because each instrument is patterned differently. For example, on the piano, if we are playing a song in the key of G, we find the G and then use our major scale pattern to find all of the notes. We discover that this key uses one black key. So in forming all of our chords, we will play that note instead of the note to the left of it. If we play our simple pattern to make major and minor triads, which is to play the note, skip a note, play a note, skip a note, and then play the note, if we begin here at G or the one, we get this chord. If we follow that same pattern, we get this chord for the two, for the three, this one for the four, the five, the six minor, and then finally the seven. Again, you will notice we only use the notes we found in the major scale. But what if we want to go up a key to A flat? A flat is located here. We then follow the pattern of the major scale to find our notes. We then make our chords following the pattern, play a note, skip a note, play a note, and skip a note, and play a note, like so. Now let's go back to G and put it all together one last time. Now here is a very common chord progression used in many popular songs. One, four, six, five. Now sometimes this will be the only information that you get about how to play the song, as the system was designed for simplicity and to be creative. So there are often a lot of blanks to fill in. Fancier chord types or inversions are often left to the creative choices of the player, which is why you will also see this system used in jazz. However, for those of us trying to replicate, it can leave out many of the wanted details. But for now, let's just keep it simple. So we find where G is, we use our major scale pattern to identify the notes available to play, we use the chord forms we've memorized or by using the major and minor triad pattern to play a note, skip a note, play a note, skip a note, and to play a note. And then we will use those chords to follow the progressions of going from one to the four to the six and then to the five. Now this is done in the rhythm and the style of the song. Let's see that in action. I hope you enjoy this introductory lesson on the Nashville number system. Be on the lookout for additional videos on this topic and on others. Thanks so much for watching and God bless.